Good evening. My name is Dorothée Humbert, and I'm the newly landed head of the Landscape Architecture section at the Knowlton School. It is my pleasure to inaugurate the Autumn Lecture Series with Ken Smith. This pleasure des derives not only from the fact that I have admired Ken's work for a long time, but also from the fact that experience doesn't breed familiarity in this context. Ken Smith manages to nudge received notions of landscape architecture rather regularly. Ken may be new to some of you, but the landscape architecture at OSU is not new to him. Some of the faculty here will remember his stint as a Glimpshire visiting professor in the spring of 2003, when he and students built or planted three dumpster gardens and strategically placed one of the dumpsters in front of OSU president's office. Take a look in the entry office and you'll see one of his collages, which are fantastic. The current name of his practice, Workshop, Ken Smith Landscape Architect, belies his own singular approach to site, whether a synthetic camouflage roof garden on top of MoMA or a large park in Orange County, and also a collaborative experimental approach, one at the intersection of art, landscape, and urban culture. His roots into provocation go as deep as his commitment to the art of making. Ken Smith graduated from Iowa State University, and that's not the provocative part, um, with a BS in landscape architecture and sculpture, and from Harvard with an MLA, still no provocation there. He was a landscape architect for the State of Iowa Conservation Commission, that's much more surprising, before working with Peter Walker and Martha Schwartz in San Francisco. That was the time of the Rio shopping center in Atlanta where they had hundreds of um, frogs painted in gold. Um, when Ken Smith formed an office with Martha Schwartz and David Meyer, their collaboration led to the village of Yorkville Park, a compressed collage of landscapes complete with a piece of the Can Canadian shield blasted, trucked, and reassembled on an urban platform. All in all, an unsettling play on scale and landscape types with razor sharp details that has received nothing less than a President's Award in 1996 and a National Landmark Award last year, both from the American Society of Landscape Architects. Since moving to New York and founding workshop in 1992, Ken has continued to investigate the role and place of landscape in the public realm. The interventions are seemingly light in their impromptu appearance. The glowing topiary garden, which is one of my favorite, transformed Liberty Plaza Park into a luminous French garden stage, maybe because it's French, I don't know. Instead of the dark sheared cones of yew on white plains of decomposed granite that we associate with the 17th, or should associate with the 17th and 18th century French garden, Kent's garden displayed white cones of awning material wrapped around existing light poles in the winter night. Minimal materials, maximum effect. He has answered the pro bono call from the Robin Hood Foundation with an outdoor learning environment and the Bette Midler's New York Restoration Project with a community garden. These are all small projects, and I feel that it is fitting to mention them in honor of one of Kent's lecture titles, which was spelled all in one word, Big Little Skip the Middle. Today, he will skip the middle and focus on the big, with projects such as the East River Waterfront Esplanade in Lower Manhattan and the Anaheim, Anaheim Packing District in California. Please welcome back Ken Smith. Thank you for inviting me back. I guess I didn't misbehave too badly last time. Let's see if I can move this thing out a bit. That's good. So I'm, I'm afraid tonight's lecture is going to be a little nerdy, uh, if you'll bear with me. Uh, I think we're going to probably go into the weeds a little bit. Uh, I, I'm sort of interested in uh, both the, uh, the uh, sort of the strategies and the concepts of making landscapes, as well as the craft. And so um, I'm going to, I'm probably going to dwell a little bit on craft tonight. I, I think we're living in kind of a craft moment, if you'll like maybe consider a Tom Brown suit, for example. Uh, a lot of what's happening in uh, Paris and 7th Avenue uh, is a kind of rethinking of uh, tradition, if you will. You'll see, you certainly see that in a, in a Tom Brown suit or the other kind of uh, things that are coming out of uh, contemporary fashion where the uh, 
the shapes and the forms aren't exactly startling. They're rooted in a kind of tradition, but there's a, kind of a new attention to the craft, rethinking the craft and the invention in the detail. So I'm going to sort of hover between the concepts and the, and the craft tonight. Um, that's my office right there behind the high line in that building. Uh, we, we're right in front of the Empire State Building. Uh, and that's uh, what, what we look like. Uh, it's a fairly open plan. It's not a very large staff at the moment. We're 12. Uh, but we have a, a, a good open office. Uh, we have a, a, a special project space that uh, is very nice because when we're working on uh, a single project that we're developing, uh, we oftentimes put that project in that room. And, and everything about that project is done there. So that room is all about one thing and thinking through. So right now it's set up, it, we're, we're doing a construction document set, and so we're, we're doing that out of the room, and there's some mock-ups and material samples that are, are going on in there. I also have a small office in California, and I put the palm tree in just so you know it's California, uh, where we've been working on uh, the, the Great Park as well as some other projects, the Anaheim Project, which I'll show tonight and uh, kind of an interesting residence in uh, Laguna Beach and uh, hopefully some other projects. So it's, uh, Dorte I think mentioned sort of the smaller projects that I was doing at the time I was here for the Glimpshire and since then uh, I've started to get larger projects. So I'm really going to focus on the, those larger projects tonight, uh, looking at four of them. First one is uh, just a piece of the, the great park, uh, the Palm Court. Uh, this is the, the master plan, which has been published quite a bit. And uh, we're going to look at this little tiny piece right here, uh, which is uh, this area. This is a, a squadron unit from 1943. This was one of the first squadron units that was built. And uh, it's being uh, converted into an arts complex. Uh, this, is, this building has been restored to hang, or these doors slide open. It's kind of a big multi-purpose space. It's a beautiful building. Uh, this has become a, a gallery space, and this has become an artist uh, studio space, and then this has become a palm court. And what you can see is, I mean, these are basically industrial sheds with loading docks. And one of the challenges was to make this whole site accessible and open as a, as a public space. So the big shift was to to fill in the grade between from loading dock to loading dock. I, I realized pretty early on that you could bring that grade up and you could merge it with the grades of this building and sort of restructure things around it to uh, reshape the terrain. So that, there you can see the, the, the extent of the grading operations, the sort of the shift uh, to, to make it uh, occupiable and accessible. And uh, this is the, uh, the, the paving plan. You can see it's very typical in my office to work through the uh, material palette. Uh, here we're working with a, a very um, elongated uh, uh, concrete paver. It's a very plain paver. It's, it's, it's actually gray concrete, it's just plain concrete. And I, I thought one of the things that was interesting was to not use fancy materials because it, uh, the the, uh, the airport, or the former airport, is really industrial space. And, and these are former warehouse sheds. And so it didn't make sense to me to bring in sort of precious material or uh, fancy material. So we were using asphalt and, and plain concrete. But we're innovating in the, the shape of the paver. It's an, it's an elongated brick. And we're paying, paying a lot of attention to the craft of how you lay it out. And in fact, we paid attention to every single paving module, and we uh, drew up very large uh, sections through this to make sure that at the, the juncture between this material and that material, the junction between this and that drain and that material, that we could lay out the entire plaza without having any slivers. Uh, slivers are sort of the, the uh, the bane of, uh, of paving. And uh, it takes a lot of work to not have slivers. Uh, so 
we worked very hard to get that kind of resolution in this space. Uh, this is some of the grading action. You can see that we're bringing the grade up here. Uh, the, there's, a, there's a certain sleight of hand that happens in this space. This is, this is the, uh, the big hangar with the sliding doors. These are those two s side buildings. This is a big arbor that wraps around the central space. And the central space is basically a, a, a taut uh, plane. It's not level, it's slightly tilted because the two buildings weren't at the same datum. But the tricky part is that when this uh, taut plane merges with this edge of this building, there's uh, a certain amount of torquing that has to happen in the, the grading in this, in this slot. Um, and if, if you don't really think about the torquing, you actually end up with a really awkward space. And so the, the whole notion here is to deal with the, um, the atypical condition of the torquing in a way that no one ever notices it. So, so for example, uh, this is all, the, this whole plaza are those pavers. They're really great for expressing a taut plane. But in this corridor here, we use simple asphalt because uh, without the joinery of the paver, the asphalt is very forgiving on a, 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 a sort of an unequal, uneven surface. So we use a super humble, super forgiving, super dumb material because it gave us the sleight of hand we needed to uh, cover up a slight defect in the larger scheme. So here you can see, um, here's the, the frame of the, um, the arbor that's being installed. The palm trees are always already in place. Um, these are la long um, shared tree pits. The paving is starting to be put in here. The pavers, you can see it's a, the top plane. And you, you can also see there's a, there's a cast in place concrete border that wraps around frames that entire surface of, of, of the unit pavers. And that's also a sleight of hand because it turns out that those two old warehouses weren't exactly totally parallel. And so I have a paving field that's made up of modules that want to execute themselves with a degree of orthogonality, but yet I've got to hide that around the edges. So the, the, the concrete frame actually disguises that. So there's actually a fair, there's a fair amount of sleight of hand and trickery that has to go in in achieving perfection. Uh, I think that one of the things that I've learned is that the more minimal and more refined and more perfect you try to make something, sort of the simpler you try to make something seem, actually the more complex it actually is. It's, it's actually a lot of work to make something seem simple. And then you can see this is where that asphalt strip goes. It kind of makes up the difference. And, and here you can see we're starting to get in some of the, uh, the walls that are starting to level up and bring up the terrain, the terrain in the larger uh, field. So then um, these are uh, the, the arbor structures that I was interested in doing. And uh, you can see where this is the operation. We're starting to put in these uh, panels. And I have been, um, as I've been flying across the country, I've, I've been uh, photographing clouds from the airplane uh, because, well, there's not that much to do on the airplane after you've seen all 14 movies. Uh, and so these, the, these patterns were based on, a, on uh, digitized clouds, uh, taking them down to about you know, one pixel per inch or something. And, and using that to uh, edit out these, these, uh, these forms. And so we, in my office, we developed this uh, hex pattern of uh, solids and voids and then editing out these, uh, these cloud formations. And there are six or seven basic patterns here. And then throughout the, the, the spread of this arbor, they go through sort of there's a basic uh, formation and then there's an inverse and a reverse and a, a flipping. So there's a, there's a whole set of variations so that no individual uh, uh, unit is identical to any of the others. It's kind of a... John Cage uh, uh, scoring uh, activity. And so these were, these were um, laser cut out of a uh, uh, 3 8 inch aluminum thick panel. The panel then are, 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 are formed with the, 
the, the standing seams so that the, they have the integral structural integrity. And then they're just simply set in place on the trough. So it's a, it's a very simple kind of uh, fabrication. This is what the, the site looks like. There's my humble asphalt strip, the forgiving strip, uh, the, uh, the uh, shade structures, the palm court. Uh, certain devices like the checkerboard are really rooted in the architecture of uh, airplane, airport space, the, the kind of graphics that you find uh, in an airport, the chevrons and things that uh, we're bringing into it. And even these kind of, uh, these are um, um, uh, uh, water ballast uh, uh, barriers that are uh, uh, bought off the shelf in orange and white and uh, arranged as a kind of uh, instant hedge. But this has been complete now uh, since 2010. Uh, there's a quite active uh, program here. This is actually a really great space for uh, social events. And so within the, the greater the precinct of a 1,300 acre park, uh, this starts to create uh, a space that's legible at the scale of human activity, social space. It starts to create a, a legible place within a, a much larger uh, terrain of, uh, of a large uh, park. Uh, these walls are also part of that grading operation. This is a sort of an outdoor performance area. And then uh, this also is part of that uh, uh, camouflaging of the torquing with, uh, in this case, uh, an olive grove. So this is some of the ground views. You can see the, uh, the, the, how the clouds work as, as shadow and, uh, and what they uh, look like. And the, uh, the arbor is very intentionally uh, uh, thought of as a it's, a, it's a framing device that, that holds the courtyard, gives a sense of scale to the courtyard, but it also starts to set up a series of uh, frames for viewing the landscape uh, beyond the courtyard, but looking outward into the larger landscape. My paving again, you see I like paving. And then uh, these are the poche gardens at the edge. They're, they're kind of the, the filler strips that uh, frame the lawn. Uh, this is not a terribly expensive project. It's, it's simple. It's, it's, it's grass. It's concrete. Uh, it's paying attention to details. Uh, it's, the craft is, is very good. The materials are pretty simple. So uh, the, the last um, three years, I've been working on um, a redevelopment project in the uh, city of Anaheim, uh, which you all know as the uh, home of Disneyland. Uh, and uh, this is not the part of uh, Anaheim that anybody ever visits. This is on the other side of the uh, I-5. This is uh, the old city of Anaheim. This is where the uh, orange groves were. This is where the rail tracks are. This is the, uh, where the uh, warehouses and the uh, lumber yards and the, uh, the old Colony Park neighborhood is. The Colony Park neighborhood is a lovely little neighborhood of, of little bungalows that were built in the 1920s. And in the midst of the little bungalow uh, neighborhood uh, in 19, I think 18 was built the uh, Sunkist Packing House, uh, kind of a great factory for sorting oranges, putting them in uh, crates and shipping them to places like Ohio. Uh, and it's a beautiful building. It's on the National Register. Uh, it has a really quite glorious interior which is being uh, reprogrammed uh, for um, shops and restaurants. And so this is, um, this is downtown Anaheim. Uh, the city tore down most of the downtown in the 70s and sort of rebuilt it uh, more or less convincingly as a downtown. Uh, but, but it works. Uh, uh, this is the Colony Park neighborhood around at the little little bungalows. This is the I-5. Disneyland is over here. And uh, this, this is our site. And um, this is the packing house. And this is the old Packer building. This was the uh, car dealership that was built in, uh, I think, around 1928. So uh, this is a, a, a city project. My client is the, um, the redevelopment agency of, of um, Anaheim, or uh, uh, formerly 
uh, redevelopment agency because the redevelopment agencies were um, uh, elim uh, uh, eliminated by Governor Brown halfway through the project. Uh, our project was fortunate enough to be far enough along in the project that our funding uh, remained intact and we were able to complete the project. Uh, the, um, the head of the redevelopment agency, this is an interesting backstory. Uh, the, the, the neighbors and the council and everybody really wanted to save the packing house because everybody loved it. It's the only one left in the city. I, uh, I think there may be only two packing houses left in Orange County. Uh, the, the Packard building they were originally going to tear down, originally this was all going to be um, apartment blocks in here. And one day the, um, uh, Lisa, the head of the redevelopment agency, was driving by and she, for some reason, thought, uh, maybe that's not such a good idea. And so the, the city sort of stepped back. Uh, redevelopment agencies have quite a bit of latitude. They stepped back and, and they uh, decided that actually they should probably save the Packard building and they should rethink what happened uh, in between the two buildings. There are two developers involved. Uh, there's uh, Brookfield Homes. They're developing uh, uh, on, across the street. They're developing a lot of new housing. And then we're working with a really uh, smart retailer, the lab. Uh, if you've ever been to Costa Mesa, how many people have been to Costa Mesa? Not very many. You guys need to travel. Uh, so Costa Mesa is, is the, the land of shopping malls. And there's a, a, a really brilliant tiny mall uh, that my client, the lab, developed called the Anti-Mall. And the, the Anti-Mall is, is, is completely not corporate, completely not slick. And they're the developer for the, the retail on this project. So this is the Packard building, the packing house, and then this is the farmer's park in between that, that I've been working on. So the, the program, uh, is uh, a, a strong linear connection between these two anchors. There's two pavilions that are being, uh, being built, uh, a future uh, open shed and, and a lawn and uh, an olive grove. And then there's an, uh, an outdoor dining area here. There's a little uh, outdoor dining area here with a, a fireplace and a backyard area right over here with a, a fireplace. I'll show you both the fireplaces. These are my first fireplaces, so I'm kind of excited about them. And then uh, this, is, this is where the, um, the, the rail runs. There's two trains come by here every day. And um, I went to the very first meeting after we won, won the project, and I'm, I'm in the car driving up from Irvine with my staff, and we didn't have shit to show for the first presentation. <laughs> and so we're, we're driving up. We had about you know, 20 minutes to figure it out. And so I, I said, well, let's, um, let's, let's, uh, let's propose box cars. Uh, because I'd worked on this park in Santa Fe. And so uh, we, we came into this first meeting with, with really nothing to show. And I, I pitched the idea of uh, putting some uh, tracks back and uh, putting in flatbed cars or box cars to serve as outdoor cafe space. And the client loved the idea. And of, of, of everything that happened early on the project, that idea really stuck. One of the project managers was like a, a dog with meat in its mouth. And, 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 and they just, the, the boxcars just sailed through. I, I thought they would surely be cut from the budget at some point, but they didn't. Uh, this is the, uh, the shade structure that links the two projects together, kind of a, a promenade, if you will. Uh, these are the, uh, this is an early study for the, uh, the, the box cars, the flatbeds as outdoor cafe spaces. It works beautifully because on one side of the building there were old loading docks where the trucks came in. And on the other side the, the rails were there and the box cars would roll up and they would put the, the boxes of oranges into the train. So the, the floors and everything lined up perfectly on the project. We had a lot of wood that was being removed, a section of the floor was being removed so we were recycling the wood to make a series of walls in the landscape. So this is an early study about how you could, with just two modules of wood size, do a kind of interesting set of, uh, of wood fences that had different scale and different uh, uh, sort of configurations that were either above eye level or above below eye level for uh, configuring space. 
And then across the front, I, I wanted to, um, uh, well, I was thinking of, well, you know, I'm spending enough time in California. I, uh, it's, it's really a car culture there. And I was really thinking about the, uh, the, the roadside attraction and sort of how, how, a, how a site speaks to the street. And so uh, the, uh, the Farmer's Park, the name of the project becomes the kind of the signboard and sort of the, uh, uh, a kind of permeable edge to the, to the site. It's not, a, it's not a wall, it's not a barrier. Uh, it's porous enough, you can see through it, there's breaks, you can move through it. But yet it, it defines the threshold of, of the site and, and announces itself to the street. Uh, half inch tread plate, uh, single pieces. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the park itself, this is the shade structure. The farmer's market will uh, happen under the shade structure. So I didn't, um, um, the, the interesting thing about this project, uh, uh, they, they had architects for the two buildings, but when they got to the landscape, uh, the, the, the developers were really being cheap, and so uh, they, uh, they didn't have an architect, which was fine, so I got to design everything. Uh, so I had, I had a structural engineer, which was nice. So I got to do all the shade structures, I got to do all of the um, uh, fences and the walls, and I got, I got to do all the hardscape. I got, you know, I got to do everything outside of the building, which was actually kind of cool. So these, these, are, these are fairly macho for a landscape architect. Uh, little seating area. And this is the backyard. So this is a, a, a dining deck. This is a, an orange grove and crushed glass. This is uh, the first of my fireplaces. That's the, uh, the dining grove. And that's the fireplace. Uh, those are um, uh, one inch thick uh, core tin steel plates. Uh, so they're very simple. Uh, there's a little bit of structural engineering involved. Uh, and then uh, uh, gas flames. But th it's really an anchor for uh, a series of uh, a kind of convivial social spaces. Uh, one of the things that uh, my client was interested in was creating smaller scale spaces that would really uh, engender a, a good social, social life here. That's the view of the fireplace from the back. So it's also an anchor for the, the corner. It kind of holds the, the space, the, the, the neighborhood edge. And even here with the, um, with the trellis that we're creating with the, with the uh, welded wire mesh around the perimeter, we're creating an edge that uh, is a threshold, but it's also porous. Uh, one of the things that I think we were uh, really attuned to was the fact that uh, uh, the, the neighborhood connection was important to the site. Uh, the site needed a perimeter, but it was important to have a, a kind of porosity and visual connection uh, between the neighborhood and, and the, the, the site itself. This is the, the, the dining terrace that's adjacent to the, uh, the, the packing house. I had, uh, I had originally designed a, a much more adventurous uh, shade canopy here, but it didn't fit in the budget, but uh, this is okay. Uh, this is an outdoor dining area. This is the, uh, the olive grove here. This is the other um, fireplace. This is also a, a one inch thick uh, plate of core tin steel. And then I had a, a, a great big, um, my, my client said, well, we should have some of those little uh, fake logs for the, for the fireplace so people know it's a fireplace. So. We had um, a really great big artificial log fabricated. And then right across the top, there's one great big strip of uh, flame. There's a big gas jet. So when you turn this uh, fireplace on, the log has this kind of great big thrust of fire coming out of the top of it. So it, it's pretty nice. Huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, I should, I, should, I should market that. It's a good idea. <clears throat> Uh, I, we built most everything out of angle irons and, and, and dimension lumber. Uh, we used the bolts as detail. Here you can see we've put back the, um, the, the rail siding. Um, 
the craft is intentionally um, rough here. It's, 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 a, it's a rail siding, it's gravel, it's not, it doesn't have a fancy edge or anything. Uh, here we are on the day that we brought the flatbed cars in. So the first one is in place, the second one is being set up. Uh, all the politicians showed up for this one. This was a kind of a big, big event. And then this is what it looks like once we put on the decking and the railing. And the next piece is the uh, shade structures that sort of mimic the, uh, the, the box uh, car shape. And they have yet to be fabricated. So the view from the street, uh, the, the site is really uh, quite porous, it's quite open. Uh, this is the street view. You can see how it, uh, it's actually, it's, it's, it's both sort of, um, it's both sort of um, unassuming and assertive at the same time. Uh, so it, 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 it has a certain respect for the neighborhood, but yet it, it announces itself within that uh, neighborhood. And this was the uh, opening day last uh, summer. They had a big festival. And, uh, and uh, my client uh, will uh, very actively program this. So I, I think you know, most any weekend uh, there will be some events going on. There will always be uh, social and cultural activities going on. So now we'll, we'll go east. I'll show two New York projects. Uh, uh, this project I've been working on uh, eight or nine years. Um, this project was originally a master planning project that uh, uh, Shop Architects and Richard Rogers partnership won. Uh, I was brought on the team as the landscape architect. And uh, we were looking at the East River waterfront um, uh, in terms of uh, its development potential, its uh, open space potential, looking at uh, sort of the, the problems of the elevated FDR highway. Uh, and there were a number of, of uh, development proposals that were advanced for building major new uh, urban neighborhoods that would generate revenue to finance a park. Uh, Rogers was very interested in that. Uh, the neighborhood wasn't, uh, and ultimately the city wasn't. And so uh, when it was not a development project but an open space project, uh, Rogers left the team, and then Shop and my office, and along with Arup, carried the project forward. Uh, we received uh, $167 million of initial financing as part of the, uh, the rebuilding of Manhattan following uh, uh, September 11, 2001. Uh, the first piece of the project opened three years ago. Uh, and it was an interesting uh, opening. It wasn't, um, it wasn't announced. Uh, just one day the construction fencing came down. And it, it was immediately populated by people. I, 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 I got there about an hour after the fence came down. And it was like it had always been there. People had just immediately taken to it and were hanging out at it uh, like they had always been there. It was, it was kind of a remarkable, unassuming uh, occupation. Uh, and Paul Goldberger liked it a lot. Uh, it's part of um, the Bloomberg's, uh, Bloomberg administration's um, uh, broad strategy for uh, Lower Manhattan as, as well as a, a broader strategy for the city. Uh, when um, uh, early in the Bloomberg administration, Daniel Dokhtarov was the, uh, the, the deputy mayor for development. And uh, he, his, his proposition was that uh, in order for New York City to stay competitive as a world class city and as an economic, uh, world economic city, that the city needed to add about a million new uh, people and population. Uh, and so that really has been the policy of the city. And the way that that's being done is uh, in large part through reclaiming of the, the, the old waterfronts. And so uh, for the last 12 years, the city has been systematically rezoning the waterfront uh, zones of the city uh, in um, Williamsburg and Greenpoint and uh, uh, Manhattan, uh, Queens, and uh, starting to provide uh, uh, open space that will go along with those new 
neighborhoods of higher density development. And we're talking fairly high density development. Uh, if you're following the New York mayoral race, which there wouldn't be any reason why you would be, it's a, it's a quite contentious thing right now because uh, uh, a lot of people in the neighborhoods are not comfortable with the, the density that's being put in place. But, but uh, like it or not, the, the city has built in quite a bit of new density, uh, high density in these older neighborhoods. Uh, uh, the, the mayor has uh, extended subway lines. Uh, so there, there's been quite a, a redevelopment of the city in the last 12 years uh, under the proposition that we need to continue to grow and develop to be a, a world competitive city. And these waterfronts in lower Manhattan are part of that strategy. Uh, the city planning department and the mayor's office have seen the East River waterfront project, the one I'm working on, the, this two mile stretch along with the Brooklyn Bridge Park that Michael Van Valkenburg has been working on and Governor's Island that uh, West 8 is working on as the, the core of the open space for this new uh, downtown area of the city. Uh, this rectangle is the, the size and shape of Central Park, just for scale comparison. So you start to understand that the, the harbor is the, the new Central Park for uh, Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn, for the, the, the downtown of the city. So um, moving the project forward, working with uh, Greg Pastorelli at, at SHOP, uh, we started to uh, work through the, the issues of really connectivity of the waterfront to the, the neighborhoods. And uh, all the neighborhoods, this is the, the financial district, this is public housing, this is Chinatown, this is the Lower East Side. So there's a whole set of different and very diverse neighborhoods. And, and, and getting connectivity in the cross green is very important, but also getting some kind of cohesiveness in the, in the linear uh, a part of the project was also important. Uh, there's a kind of aesthetic notion. Uh, th this is a little different than, uh, say, Battery Park City. Uh, Lori Olin's project was, what, 20 years before this. And at that time uh, in, in the city, uh, Lori was trying to create a kind of grand civic space in kind of the Beaux-Arts uh, model uh, of a kind of, of grand uh, linear boulevard that was very organized uh, and really took you to the edge and was really kind of a straight shot that uh, followed the edge and had a kind of linear arrangements of trees that, that defined that space and linear lines of lampposts which articulated that space as you moved along it. I think uh, our approach was really quite the opposite. Uh, we didn't have the beautiful kind of space that Laurie had on the west side because we have the, the infrastructure or the highway and things. And so we were trying to create a space that uh, was actually much uh, less formal. Uh, we worked very hard to create a kind of meander. Uh, you really, in fact, cannot walk a straight line here. You have to kind of move in and out of the space. And we, we wanted to create a space that was really much more kind of responsive to its edge conditions and circumstances than in, imposing a kind of uh, linear uh, uh, prerogative on the, on the space. So this is the, the first piece. This is the uh, pilot project that was finished three years ago. You can see that uh, uh, it's really a quite artificial circumstance. It's largely on structure. Uh, we're half the site or more is underneath the FDR, so that's a kind of complicated thing. Uh, it's separated from the city by a fairly busy street, South Street, that carries a lot of traffic and fast traffic. But it is a glorious piece of waterfront, and it's really quite beautiful. Uh, and you can start to see uh, the setting up of the, of the space, this kind of informal uh, uh, I guess, uh, meander, if you will, that, we, that we've created. So the, what, what Greg and I uh, talked about early on and, and, and have been able to carry forward was really the notion that the, the, the way we could create a space that could respond to the various conditions along the way, but yet also have a kind of cohesiveness was to develop a, a, a kit of parts idea. 
So uh, there's, a, there's a railing that uh, Greg is largely responsible for that has, um, it's really quite simple, it has a vertical, it has a tilted out and a tilted inward segment. It has uh, two different cap circumstances. It has a fairly limited set of parts, but within that there's a, a lot of different variation that can happen. I developed a, a paving system that could negotiate the strange circumstances. Uh, I developed the, the seat walls uh, that set up the, the circumstance where we could have soil for planting. And then shop in my office collaborated on the, on the furnishing system. We worked with Susan Tillotson on the lighting. Uh, that purple uh, girder is uh, a two mile long light fixture. I'll show it to you in a bit to show you how it works. Uh, and what you'll see is there, there's, no, there's no light poles in the project uh, and it doesn't have a kind of uh, imperative of a, of, a, of a straight line. And so uh, these, uh, these large uh, dunes, planters, start to set up the, the structure of the space and the way that you start to move through it. Uh, the planter walls also then become the infrastructure for the, the social uh, seating that uh, create the pockets of space along the way. This was the early, an early model that came out of my office and started to look at the, uh, the paving idea. And because all of this was on structure, we only had about, um, I think, maybe six inches of depth below the, the paving surface. So there really was no soil. And it's actually, it's more perverse than that. Underneath the FDR highway structure where there was no light, there was soil. Uh, outside of the FDR highway structure where we had light, there was no soil. So it was a very, um, um, not, not, a, it was not a propitious uh, kind of a circumstance. So th the idea was uh, to, to put in these uh, uh, sea wall, seat walls that would then give us the uh, structure to create the, the soil dunes that we needed. And the dunes are large enough that we would get enough soil volume that we could get a, a robust planting community. And then the seat walls would then be outfitted with the social infrastructure of the, of the project. And you can see even early on there's a kind of uh, wildness intended in the plantings, uh, which you can see in the, in the final project. This is from the uh, second season. So you can see that the plantings that have come in very quickly, they're, they're not dainty plants, they're not shy, they're, they're pretty robust. And so the, 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 the seating kit of parts, it, it's a very simple uh, set of uh, forms, but there are kind of conventional seats. There's the chaise lounges, which are very popular. There are uh, kind of little benches, and then there are, are bar stools. And we're also developing some kind of terrace seating in our current uh, package four. Uh, this is my client, Amanda Burden, uh, commissioner of city planning. And uh, I have to say that uh, this project wouldn't be the project it is without her. Uh, uh, Amanda is, uh, for public service, servant, uh, uh, very interested in design, in good design. She's a champion of design. Uh, she's been very active in the project. Uh, here we're mocking up the, uh, the bench and Amanda is making sure it's comfortable. I've seen her on construction sites walking through piles of rubble in her Tory birches and, and negotiating it <laughs> better than anyone else. On, on the site when we were doing mock-ups of everything during construction, there, there were many times when uh, something was mocked up for approval and Amanda would look at it and she would say, uh, I don't think it's good enough. And that's pretty rare. And, for a public project. And so we were, we were able to achieve a very high level of uh, craft and construction, uh, largely because of, uh, of Amanda's uh, insistence. Uh, the seating um, uh, is something that Amanda's particularly interested in. Uh, and uh, she's very much a kind of a disciple of Holly White, uh, as am I. And uh, we spent a lot of time uh, thinking about how the seating works. And, and this one in particular, 
I, I think is really great. To, uh, sort of thinking about how you can sit and have a conversation, perhaps, or sit side by side, but also how within that kind of basic construction, you could put your feet up. The, the sort of multiplicity of, of, of how the seating works as a kind of a social um, uh, apparatus, I, I think, is, uh, is interesting. And I think that uh, one of my challenges would be to the, the landscape architects that, that sort of in the arc of my career, we've been through a kind of a art moment in the uh, 80s and a kind of uh, ecology moment in the, uh, in the 90s and 2000s. And I, I think that uh, we might be moving into kind of a social moment when, when we actually really need to be thinking about uh, sort of the, the social spaces that we're creating in, in public places and how we're engineering the social places, how we're thinking about uh, sort of uh, uh, behavioral science and how we're really sort of uh, creating uh, good social places within the city. Uh, lately, I've become a, a real proponent of long benches. Uh, 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 there was a moment in the 80s when uh, most municipalities were uh, creating what I would call mean seating, seating with all sorts of apparatus so that you couldn't lie down, uh, very antisocial kind of attitude uh, for a social space. Uh, I think these these are much more comfortable in, in some way, but there's still, um, on, a, on a normal bench, there's still a kind of social space where uh, people will sit and be comfortable. They'll sit with people they know, uh, but people won't necessarily sit with strangers. And so I become interested, in Des Moines, uh, we're doing a project where I'm, I'm starting to introduce long benches, long seating elements because I think that you need a, a kind of length of social space so that people will have enough comfort that they will sit with people that they don't know. Uh, and it's a kind of a, a social idea that uh, one of the roles of public space is that you might actually meet people that you don't know, or you might meet people who are not like you, or you might meet people from another neighborhood. And so starting to think about how you engineer seating that might encourage people to sit with strangers I think is a kind of worthy idea. And so that's something I've been uh, thinking about and working on. Uh, you can see this kind of forced meander that moves you through the space. Uh, it's, very, it's a very comfortable space. People, it's very intuitive. Uh, people seem to be very comfortable here. Uh, it has sort of all uh, aspects of sort of daily life. It's different during the day than it is at night. Uh, People uh, hang out. Uh, it's a, a very, I think it's a very successful social place. Uh, I'll, in a minute, I'll show you this pier. We built a new pier as part of the project. This is the paving. Um, this is related to my clouds that um, the shade structure. This is digitized water to generate the paving pattern uh, using a jumbo hex block. And this is uh, what it looks like. Uh, it's, a, it's a pattern that's very uh, adaptable to strange geometries, which we had to, to deal with. Uh, it's a little bit like the sleight of hand of the uh, asphalt. If I'd had a very kind of pure geometric plan, it would really call attention to all the strange conditions along the edges. If I had a, 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 a completely neutral ground plane, it would have been very kind of dull and inanimate. But this is animated, but it's actually very flexible in that it can kind of move with all the shifts and uh, changes in the length of the space. So here's, this is one of the nerdy parts. This is, this is the, the edge of the platform. So this is the soil area, and this is the uh, platform area. So you see some of our dunes are on land and some are not. Uh, we were able to get enough soil that we could get some canopy trees. Uh, we did uh, break the seawall and create a, a, a set of tide steps, uh, which were quite exciting during the hurricane. And then we're programming sort of interesting uh, spaces underneath the, the bridge. Uh, I'll show you a, a dog run we're doing, working with uh, the state uh, athlete community. Uh, 
on a, a skate park on package four currently. Uh, but this is the sort of detail of how that works. Um, even, even with um, even with the mounding uh, Arup told me I still could only have a certain amount of soil. And so we still we have a certain amount of uh, foam fill to give us the, uh, the the shape of the dune that we needed to give us our profile. Uh, this is a very complex uh, uh, kind of undertaking. It seems simple, but uh, the sort of the thought and the engineering that goes into creating the planting system is uh, very important to making a successful planting. Uh, the planting plant is, uh, I think, fairly meat and potatoes. It's not very, it's not very fancy. Uh, the plant palette is not very fancy. Um, uh, this is the, uh, the soil spec. Um, I did, um, there's, a, there's a subsoil that is, um, if you look at this, it's about 40% aggregate, 15% uh, sand. There's only 30% topsoil in the subsoil. It's, it's actually fairly porous. It's, it's fairly lean as soils go. And then the top layer is 85% uh, topsoil. So what we're doing it here is we're actually, uh, we're actually creating a kind of soil horizon that would be similar to what you might find in nature. If you go out and dig in uh, a woodland, you'll find that the, the top layers have a lot more organic material and humus than the subsoil la layers. So even though this is engineered soil and completely artificial, we're setting up a kind of uh, soil horizon uh, uh, to uh, mimic uh, nature in that way. This is this was the first season. I, I'm kind of embarrassed by how thin it looks. Uh, I mean, it, it, the first year never looks good. Um, even even though I put the flowers in, it still didn't look good. Uh, this is the second season, so it it uh, the soils worked, the plant palette worked. We got a, a lot of growth in that first uh, season. We, we did pay attention, these are mostly natives, we did pay attention to uh, color and texture, you know, basic simple things, but it's, it's a pretty simple plant palette. This is the second season, late autumn second season. Uh, that's the plant palette. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, wholly native. Uh, but it's mostly native. Uh, I put in some things that I liked. Uh, things that I knew would do well, uh, like Rosa Rogosa and uh, Hollywood Juniper. This is the uh, dog uh, run, so to speak. Um, I, I thought of it as a dog playground. Um, Amanda was asking me my, my, this is the first dog uh, dog facility I've ever done. Amanda was asking me about my philosophy on designing for dogs. And I said that I thought, I don't know if this, I don't know if this is correct or not, but this is, this is what I was thinking. Uh, I, I thought that uh, a, a dog playground is like a children's playground. Uh, and so I thought of it that way. You know, children's playground is basically children running around and being active, and, uh, and they have uh, caretakers, parents that are watching after them, and there's all sorts of social life and deals and things happening with the parents. They're discussing who should be on the school board and stuff, and the kids are having a good time. And, and the same thing happens in a dog facility. The, 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 uh, the, the caretakers are talking about who should be the next mayor or what's wrong downtown, and, uh, and, and the dogs are kind of oblivious to that. And, and I also, I also said I, that you know dogs are social, like like uh, children, and that we should think of a dog space as creating a, so, a good social environment for the dogs. That there should be a subdivision of, of spaces, uh, just in the way you would do spaces for humans. So there's big spaces and small spaces, and so we, we basically created a space for dogs, which uh, thinks of them as uh, social beings. Uh, that are uh, having creative play. Uh, and it was kind of a fun thing to do. Yeah, 
the mayor came up and was uh, speaking to the constituents on the opening day. <laughs> And that was the, uh, the, 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 uh, the formal opening with the mayor speaking. And you can see the, uh, the tide steps uh, behind the mayor. Uh, the, the tide steps uh, are quite remarkable. Uh, this was a, a video, which of course doesn't work in uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, PDF that we burned it onto. But uh, this was during um, uh, Hurricane Irene. The water came, uh, this was about an hour after by the time I got over. So the water came all the way to the, the top of the tide steps in Irene. Hurricane Sandy a year ago uh, came uh, four or five feet above uh, our pavement level. So all of our planting dunes were inundated. Uh, the, whole, the whole project was inundated. Uh, but the but materials were durable enough that we, uh, the plantings survived uh, quite well. We had a little bit of replacement, but not too much. Uh, things uh, did quite well. The chief problem we had was with the electrical system. Uh, we had uh, a fair amount of uh, problem with that. This is uh, the, the pier, Pier 15. Uh, Greg and I argued that a two-level pier would be better than a, a flat pier. Uh, we made the argument that you would get twice the public space. Uh, I did that because I wanted to create an elevated uh, uh, landscape. Greg did it because he wanted to build a building. Uh, but that's fine. Uh, the, the motives merged. And uh, this is now a, a restaurant, a, a beer garden under here. There's a, there's a, a, a museum that will go in uh, over there. Uh, there's a, a, a strip of landscape that runs through on the top. It's uh, lawn and, and there's a little sunken Woodland Garden uh, here. And this is the, uh, the lawn piece. Uh, and it's really quite nice being uh, a little bit elevated uh, in the city. That's the, uh, the sunken garden. That's the, a little uh, seating area. And uh, what, what's amazing in uh, contemporary public life is how people use public space. Like uh, this person is talking on the cell phone. I think he's photographing his girlfriend. These guys are, I think, sitting next to each other but talking to each other uh, on, their, on, their, on their devices. Uh, and, and other people are just kind of uh, hanging out. But um, it's, it's really remarkable kind of when you think about how people use public spaces in, in the contemporary city. Hmm? There's a, there's a, there's a, a, there's a ramp here, there's a stair over here, there's another stair, there's uh, three different ways to, to get up. It, people like it up here, it's a very comfortable place. So the lighting, um, the, uh, we didn't want any light poles. We didn't, in, in New York City it's very hard to light public space because most of the agencies uh, require you to use uh, standard fixtures and we did not want any of those ugly standard fixtures and so uh, the design team did absolutely everything we could to figure out how to light this thing without any light poles so we built lights into the the, uh, the furniture but the but the big brilliant move was thinking of that two mile long beam as a reflector and so Susan Tillotson has, these are all LED blasters that she's lined two miles of LED strips that uh, shine on that and bounce the light back down on the project. And so it creates a very nice kind of uh, ambient light. It creates a really nice kind of lavender strip, which looks good from Brooklyn. Uh, and it's very effective. And then we put lighting up underneath the, uh, the FDR to light the functional space. So that's what it looks like at night. Now the, the piece that we're, so that's the pilot project. Package two is just completing construction. Package three is in construction. And package four, we're just finishing the construction documents on. So I'll show you package three, which is under construction. And this is Pier 35. So Greg really had the lead on Pier 15 because it was a building. 
Uh, I had a little more lead on this one because it went to see the more of a, of a, of a landscape. And so uh, it's really a, a series of folded planes. There's a big vine curtain back here, and there's a, an, uh, a tidal inlet here that's been designed for uh, mussels. So that's the, um, uh, the mussel habitat. Uh, we call it Mussel Beach. Uh, you can see the, the vine curtain back there. Uh, these are the folded uh, turf and uh, dune features. So, so unlike the esplanade where the dunes were more naturalistic, uh, this is a much more articulated uh, landscape. And then at the end there's a kind of raised platform uh, and a big sun visor that, that folds out that will be um, uh, hung with porch swings. Uh, because uh, East River, it, this is our front porch, and uh, uh, I just personally think we don't have enough porch swings in public space today. So this is uh, sort of the view of that, an early view. Uh, this is the uh, eco park with the mussel habitat. Greg has designed this amazing bridge that goes across. It's fairly transparent, so you can look down and see the uh, bivalves, and then you see a one of the porch swings down there. Uh, this is a planting plan that we're developing for the, uh, uh, for the uh, vine curtain. It's um, 35 feet tall, and I think about 600 feet long. So it's a pretty big trellis. We're mixing the vines together in a way that will create a kind of interesting uh, or ornamental set of shifts uh, over the course of the season. And then, and then this is the eco park. This piece of the pier had actually collapsed. And so rather than rebuild the pier, uh, our client um, applied for a grant. We got a, a $900,000 grant from the uh, State Department to build a mussel habitat. I, I, I don't know how that works, but I'm, I'm glad it did. Uh, this is, a, this is um, a sewer out. This is a storm sewer outfall. We have combined storm sewer out in New York City. So you know what happens during a big storm event here. Uh, and you can see where you can see the rockeries have started to be put in place here for the, uh, for the mussels. So this is the profile of that, uh, the section of the whole thing. This was a, 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 a later model uh, starting to develop the uh, articulated form uh, low tide and high tide, so that uh, twice a day it fills up, twice a day it empties out. This was the, uh, the, the first uh, study I did of the rockeries. Uh, this wedge is just a simple dumb gradient from big rocks to little rocks. This one is a more complicated set of zones. So this is a mixing of uh, two sizes of rocks. This is a mixing of two different sizes of the rocks so that it's, it's a jumble, but it ultimately gradates down. Uh, this, is, this was sort of the moment that it became really exciting. Uh, there's something really incredible about infrastructure projects uh, uh, because you get to work at a scale that's kind of amazing, right? at engineering scale. And so this is, uh, uh, I mean, I knew this thing was big, but this is the precaster near Syracuse, and sort of, you know, understanding the scale of these precast concrete blocks. My staff, this is my staff here, were up there. They personally supervised the placement of every single rock so that they had exactly the right space between them. They, they didn't quite touch, but they, you know, had enough space. Uh, the the, the uh, gradations work properly. And you can see that it's a, it's a pretty beautiful thing. We worked with uh, ecologist Ron Oleveris. He advised us on uh, the texture. This is a standard form liner, but the crevice is the uh, biologic, biologically right shape for mussels. Uh, the pieces came in by barge uh, down the Hudson River and around the bottom and up the East River. Uh, we had the largest crane on the East Coast uh, to install the, the biggest piece. This is a 57-ton uh, block of concrete. And you can see the, the 
pieces are already in place. You can see the, uh, the rebars that then the, the rocks get then permanently set upon. And this is the piece that uh, low tide, you can see this is already a couple months in, we're already getting some really nice slime, which is good. And uh, you can see this is the tide. Uh, what's interesting is that it, it's almost impossible to see tide change in New York City because we have vertical seawalls. You just, you just can't perceive it. But this is one of the few places where you can actually see the tide moving in and moving out. It's, it's, it's not a very big thing, but it's, it's actually quite nice. Uh, this is another video uh, that, that doesn't work in that PDF, but this is at uh, high tide. You can see the, uh, the footings are in place for Greg's uh, bridge here. And uh, that's really my presentation. So. Okay, uh, if there's any questions, if you need to leave, Go ahead, if you have a question, uh, we'll take a couple questions, so. And in your presentation, I really loved the image that you were exploring, um, climbing around in the muscle beds. And I thought, that's a great muscle habitat, but it's also a really great space for a person in one of these projects. And I kind of believe that it's between the scale of the infrastructure and the landscapes, kind of landscaping that's kind of human life. And I thought that would be I think we're starting to see in the contemporary practice a lot of more bench things. So uh, when, when I was a student, we were taught to 3D, which was Fred's balls and benches. Uh, but today I think it's really the yes, it's, it's, it's uh, sustainability and social space, so it's seating. It's places to sit, not necessarily a bench. Uh, I think there's a kind of different attitude about how the infrastructure, how you use a space. So, I mean, I think a lot of spaces uh, need to be more flexible. So if something can uh, serve as a car table or a seat or serve as a place you can stretch the leg after jogging, uh, it's really a more usable kind of feature than something that's traditionally been for products. And so I think clearly that's something that's happening at the profession online. But the, the, the notion of ambiguity is interesting. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Brian Eno's music. And, and I remember in, in his um, ambient, in the airport, one of the ambient albums, he talked about the, the idea of ambient as being something that is uh, equally um, not there and there, or sort of equally um, visible and not visible. And, and, and that's a kind of interesting position. And, uh, and I think if you can create a space that does it, or hovers between asserting itself and receding, uh, that's kind of interesting to know what that is. I was at the Easter Bird Florida project like two years ago, and at that time the seat benches didn't have skate guards, and I really liked that because I thought yeah, it was a whole new and a bunch of like encouraging segments and cultures, and kind of like, you like the wear and tear, I like that, but the last few years I noticed. I, I was, but I'm fine. Well, what happened was I, I had, I, I, I sort of lost control of it anyway, right? I, I, I wanted to put the stainless steel edges on the big cast uh, because uh, my thought was that you can grind away on a stainless steel edge and you can get it hurt. Uh, about midway through design, uh, Michael was installing his playground at Brooklyn Park with these stainless steel domes. And some child burned their thigh on stainless steel, and everybody in city government went into kind of a tizzy over exposed stainless steel parts in the landscape. And there was a kind of mandate that there couldn't be any stainless steel. So suddenly, my stainless steel, imagine the whole idea of, you know, 
tightened this thing sort of up in the air, and I got pushed into uh, having to powder coat those edges uh, because we did some research and we found that powder coat would insulate the temperature or solve the problem, or so I got more of that on that. But, but then when we, we built the project and the skateboard started burning on the powder coat edges, of course, it ruined the powder coat and then we kind of all uptight about that. So then we had to come back and put the thing on. So I wasn't happy about that. I, I, uh, I just think the skateboards are legitimate and fine. So, we, so that, that's why we're building that skate that board facility in the next phase. So, no, I hate those things. I hate them in the same way that I hate the, the stupid mean things that they put on the bitches in the anus and can't lie down. Those things are the pieces of the ass. But that's, that's how it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>